Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, dear vascular surgery and, and geology family along the universe. On behalf of the VOT team, I welcome you all to the fifth webinar meeting. I would like to thank uh, Sigvaris Group for sponsoring our meeting today. And it's an honor to introduce our speakers and welcome our speakers, Dr. Erika Mendoza from Germany, Dr. Mark Whitley from the United Kingdom, and uh, the Dr. Tanjin Tang, Tanjin Tang from Singapore. Also, I would like to welcome our panelists, Dr. Uh, Orwin, uh, Erwin Tudner from Netherlands, uh, Dr. Alvaro Orego from Chile, and uh, still waiting for Dr. Dennis from Russia and the Rojin Dell from India. Welcome, and let me introduce our first speaker, Dr. Erika Mendoza. She's the General Secretary of German Society of Philopology and member of the Educational Committee of International Union of Philopology. She studied medicine in Spain, specialized and learned topics in Germany. By 1999, this was the first contact with Chaiva in Spain, Italy, and France. And on 1999, she is performing Doblix hemodynamics for venous surgeons in center in Germany. But she's performing sclerotherapy and uh, ablation by herself. She's investigator of the basics of philopology regarding anatomy and physiology. And she has a very interesting book, The Doblix Ultra, uh, Ultrasound of Leg Veins softness vein sparing surgery. Now, I'm uh, delighted to uh, introduce uh, the first talk for her, Doblix ultrasound of terminal and preterminal valve in varicose vein evaluation with clinical application. The mic is your, Erika. Thank you, thank you, Ayman, very much for your introduction. And I'm very pleased and honored to be in this group, in this large group, and thank you for your great effort and thank Sigvaris, of course. So I start, I hope this works. This is my, my presentation. I hope this, yes, I have no conflict uh, of interest in this one. And I would like to start with a polling question. Um, and I don't know how this will work. Yes, the question is, uh, when I investigate a patient, I perform a duplex ultrasound personally on my patients, or um, if you uh, have a person in your team to do it, or you, if you have to send the patient to another place to do the um, investigation. So I have voted. I don't know how long it takes now. It takes about 30 seconds. Okay. So you can have maybe a couple of the slides and then we can have the results. Or if you want to wait, maybe another 15 seconds. I can, I can go on, results. yes. I can, um, uh, okay, I do it like this. So, um, I didn't know that all the, all the right, do you all, is, can, can, I, can I change this because all the right part of the field is cut? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But okay, I try. Oh, here is the result. Yes, that's interesting. So most of the most of the colleagues are investigating their patients by their own. This is interesting because, for example, in England and United States, they have somebody in the team. So the the audience that is listening is really doing the ultrasound by themselves. This is very interesting. So. My, my, um, I, my point is to analyze the saphenofemoral junction and the, and the function of the terminal and preterminal valve. And I think this is so interesting and so important because if you wanna, if you are doing new, new methods, like uh, when, we, when we went from high ligation and stripping to, to endoluminal treatments, and we analyze the differences between both, and this is the recidives and the, the recurrences in the, in the groin, 
um, we have to know about the situation pre-operatively because um, this could give you a hint of the reason why the recurrency came and perhaps you could change your your point of view of treating when you analyze these valves. So I uh, move to the, the next. Um, so I will try to work out that the documentating before the treatment, what is the situation on this at this level, um, will do a better, a better analysis. Just a short, uh, everybody knows, but I just to put the, us all together, artery, deep femoral vein or common femoral vein. This is this great saphenous vein. Do you see my mouth moving here? Yes? Yes, okay, perfect. So, and these are the valves. These are the valves, the terminal valve, the preterminal valve. Um, and the deep vein, of course, is also a valve. And then we have the tributaries in the groin. I have only painted two, but everybody knows that there can be lots of them. And then we have the anterior accessory saphenous vein, which plays a role also in the recurrences, as we know. So this is um, the anatomic situation. And uh, to, to elicit a, a flow in this in this situation, we know that we have to do some um, some provocation maneuvers to to go ahead. So we have the valsalva. Everybody knows. And everybody knows that people have difficulties doing Valsalva. So this is why, um, um, yeah, I do or don't see it. Uh, in Cremona, Franceschi and De Frate developed the system. You take a straw and uh, uh, fold it and flow um, and um, blow into the straw. And then you have, uh, you have a, a little Valsalva, but people is able to do it. Compression of the calf, everybody knows. And then the toe elevation maneuver that is easy to perform. And you have the weight transfer maneuvers. And the last one, which I think it's the most interesting one, is the dependency maneuver. I will come back to this a little longer. Sometimes you have patients where you see the varicose veins and you think this should be from the saphenous vein. But when you make a manual compression, decompression, for example, you find no, uh, no, uh, no flow, no reflux. Then you can uh, lay the patient down for 20 seconds with a never elevated leg and then record the flow at the, very, at the same place. And the leg has gone empty while the leg was laying down. And when the patient gets standing up again, you have one or two minutes of retrograde flow. And this is a very, very easy to perform and very exact uh, form to sort out if there is a reflux. So again, this is the uh, normal in standing compression, decompression, you have no flow. And then the same patient lay down, stand up again. And this, this I, I do once a week. I mean, this is one of 50 patients where you stay and say, curious, I think he should, but I don't see it. Then do this maneuver because you will, you will sometimes will be very surprised about the amount of blood flowing into this vein. So you have, uh, two different groups of, man of maneuvers. One is, um, uh, the, the ones are down to top, you provoke a maneuver physiologically with a movement. This is the systole, and then you wait what the blood does in the diastole. And then you have the top to down maneuvers, which is Valsalva or Cremona, because you press the blood into the leg. And you have the dependency maneuvers. This is the one I told, it's filling the leg independently of the muscle uh, force of the leg. And here I come to the pitfalls because um, manual compression of the calf and release. I have little, little, little hands. My manual compression is less than if a, a strong man does it. Or toe elevation and weight transfer maneuvers depend on the muscle disorders of the patients. Valsalva, you know, somebody and much, much of the people is not able to do it properly. And, and this dependency maneuver is always working correctly. So for me, it's the queen. And just to remember, if you are in doubt, do the dependency maneuver and you will be very pretty sure if there is a reflux or no and if where it comes from. So to summarize, the most often used maneuvers, of course, are manual compression and any type, a type of toe elevation or weight transfer maneuvers. And you have to analyze the flow in the diastole after you have provoked the, the flow up, up to the heart and you wait what happens afterwards. If the valves close, there will be no reflux or the flow backwards will be less than 0.5 seconds. That demonstrates that the valve is competent.
just a little revision. This is the flow in the systole, the muscles make their work and then the flow goes up. And when they release the, the power, you have no reflux, this is healthy. And this is obviously a reflux uh, longer than one second. This is one second and the flow goes downwards in the vein after having squeezed it. So we always observe the face after our maneuver. And this is a little video. We, had a, we have a video tick in the German society um, website. You see this elevation maneuver. You have a little systole and a long lasting reflux afterwards. Again, the systole and again, the reflux. And this is a, a way to see how uh, the blood is in an in in um, incompetent vein. And now you will see that I move the, um, the transducer to another place, the vein is healthy, and then you have the autograd flow and no reflux. So this is what we test when we do um, the maneuvers. Coming back to the exploration of the groin, where it, which will be my next step, first I want to make a question again to the audience. Is the treatment you decide depending on the findings at the terminal and preterminal valves? Or do you treat depending on the presence of reflux but independence uh, where the flow sources? Or do you treat based on the clinical findings? I know it's not so easy to answer the question, but you only can choose one. Of course, provided always that the patient has an illness. I mean, uh, you treat the clinical findings. I mean, you, you don't do duplexes, this question. Obviously, you treat always according to the clinical findings. But when you have decided to treat this patient, the way to treat him is depending on one of these questions. So again, I, I go on. Oh, it's already ready. So I, I thought this would be like this, 36% the majority treat independently of the source. This is okay, but nevertheless, I would very much encourage in the future to just to write down what the first source were to analyze the recurrences, but we will see that later on. So now we have our image of the competent valves in the, in the groin, the, the flow uh, in, a, in a healthy person and the tributaries have their flow also. And when there is a reflux in the great saphenous vein, we have to know from where it comes. Mostly, it will come from the deep vein through the terminal and preterminal valve, and this is called axial reflux. And this means that the terminal and the preterminal valve are incompetent. This is shown in the longitudinal, we have a longitudinal um, uh, cut through the, through the groin, uh, this is systole, the flow is up, upwards, and then in the diastole, it comes from the deep vein through the both valves into the great saphenous vein. Again, an image uh, you measure in this point, you, have, you measure at the very level of the terminal valve, and so you can document in color and in PV that there is a reflux. This is the systole again, and this is the diastole, and this is the, the, the place where the deep vein ends and the great saphenous vein enters into the deep vein. And there is where you have to measure to sort out if the terminal valve is competent or not. So the other option is that the terminal valve is competent and the reflux comes from the tributary with competent terminal valve. This is called paraosteal reflux because the ostium, this is the ostium level. Uh, the surgeons know that. And the reflux isn't coming through the ostium, but it's coming from another place, paraosteal. It's not an axial reflux. And this, you see again, a longitudinal view. This is the systole with an autograde flow. And this is the diastole, where the reflux does not come from the deep vein, but from the tributary. And if you once have seen it, like here in this presentation, you will always rediscover it in your patients. Another example, Systole with inflow, diastole, there is no reflux from the deep vein, but only from the tributary. And in the cross section again, you see that at this level, there is the terminal valve and there is no flow. The difference is between a competent and incompetent terminal valve. This is an incompetent valve. You have the reflux from the deep vein. This is a competent terminal valve. You have the reflux from another way, not the deep vein. 
What happens in Valsalva if you have a competent terminal valve? You will see when you press that the, that the ostium level is uh, broadening, but there is no reflux during the Valsalva. And when you then release the Valsalva, in the, people, the person can uh, breath again, you will have the inflow and the flow towards the deep vein, but no reflux. This is again a little movie. I it's hope, amazing. sorry, I, I have to put the, this is a movie about this exploration at the, at the terminal and pre-terminal valve. You see uh, uh, when the terminal valve is incompetent, it can escape through the accessory or, or into the great saphenous vein. And the exploration of the terminal um, valve is either in cross section, in color, but if you want to document it, you always have to use the PV curve because reflux is, is, a, is a flow over time. So you have always to have a, a PV mode to show what, what's happening. And this is at the preterminal valve level. You have to document also there uh, that the reflux is present. So now we have the fourth image, which we don't see. Uh, at the right side, uh, it's a reflux from both. I, I tell you, there the, the flow comes not only from the deep vein, but also from the also from the tributary. You have this and this in one case. It's the right image. Then we have the situation that we know where the reflux comes from, but we also have to know where it goes to. And this could be only the uh, great saphenous vein only the accessory anterior or again behind the lovely guys here or to the right uh, we see that the reflux could go into both could drain into both of them so to explore the difference between the great saphenous vein and the accessory anterior vein you have to Im imagine a line at the medial aspect of the uh, common femoral vein and the vein going medially is the great saphenous and the vein going laterally is the accessory anterior. This is not always like this, but mostly, mostly you find it like this. This is a systole, the blood uh, in the, when the person moves or you have a calf compression, the blood drains into the deep vein. And this is diastole, the blood goes out through the terminal valve, which is incompetent, but not escaping into the great saphenous, but into the anterior accessory, like the image shown to the left. So the standard for exploration uh, the great saphenous vein junction is in standing. Um, just to get an idea of the morphology of everything, you should do a, morph a longitudinal and a cross-section imaging. And it is always more easy to do the exploration in color duplex because it's, it's quick and you see everybody. And if you want to document the findings for the, for, your, for the records, at least in Germany, this is very important. You need to have it um, in the records of the patient documented that there was really a reflux. Um, you have to do this either in PV because you have this curve over the time, or you have to do it um, uh, doing a film in the color. But a film is always very, a lot of data. So PV is, is better. And what is very important, as I've shown earlier, you have to do two maneuvers if you explore the groin. If it's obvious that there is a reflux, you can skip the second one. But it, if, if it's not obvious, uh, you should both because um, sometimes with one maneuver, there is no reflux and with the other, it is. So to be sure. After having explored the great saphenous vein, uh, the saphenous femoral junction, you have to be sure to know the source of the reflux, where the reflux comes from. You have to know the path of the retrograde flow to where it drains and, and where it comes back to the deep vein, but that is another, another lecture. So there is a group from Germany that they made a large investigation on 2019 patients. What's well, not the year, it was the number of the patients. Uh, they had scheduled for intervention in their office and they divided the finding into four groups. The group A was those with the axial reflux, those with the reflux from the deep vein into the great saphenous vein with the terminal valve incompetency. You see, this is the largest number of patients uh, they found in their surgery group. 
um, both, as I told you earlier, that the drain, the, the reflux comes from the deep vein and also from the common, uh, from the common femoral vein, but also from the tributaries in 8.4%. Uh, and this called crania, a cranial reflux, paraosteal reflux, it was in 20%. This is not a little number. So 20% of patients patients have a reflux coming from the um, from the um, tributaries in the groin, and there this group was those with the perforator at the proximal thigh. So our interest is this group of patients, 21%, and if you take this one together, they are 30% of patients they have a reflux from the pelvic system, and this could be very interesting when we consider the recurrences. I don't wanna tire you with numbers, but just to remember, 52 patients have this situation, terminal valve, preterminal valve, and 66 have the terminal valve incompetency. And 122 of the patients had the reflux from the deep vein into the ante accessory anterior vein only. I think this is so little um, because they used to foam them if this is a little, um, if, if, if the accessory is not so large, they don't operate them or they don't make endoluminal therapy. And these ones are those with a reflux from the, from the tributaries in the groin, draining into the saphenous vein. This were isolated, this is 15%, but with all the other options draining into the accessory and so on, they have 21% of patients with a competent terminal valve and an incompetent preterminal valve. So now, the next question is, when you do the treatment of the endoluminal, the endoluminal treatment of the great saphenous vein, the recurrences we have learned often are through the accessory anterior vein. So the question is, if, um, if the accessory vein is present or not, how do you treat it? I always treat only the great saphenous vein, I treat the accessory anterior vein if it's refluxive or I close the accessory vein always if it's present, even if it's non-refluxive. So perhaps we can have the polling now. Are you hearing? Are you? Yes, polling is running. Ah, there is the polling, okay. You can continue till yes. we get the... Yes, I was, I continue. So if we, I, I'm so sorry, this is cut on the right side. Um, I'm sorry. Um, this is the analysis of recurrences after surgery of the great um, saphenous vein. I, I think not so many still do surgery, but here in Germany, we are doing it. And so this is a perfect performed high ligation. You see a longitudinal view of the common femoral vein. And here you see, where the surgery has been done, it's two or three weeks after, and it's a perfect, no, no stump, everything is perfect. Here you have an obvious stump, or again, the common femoral vein. Here you have the proximal aspect of the, of the great saphenous vein. You even see the terminal valve, and this is the place where the knot was done. And this one is um, a common femoral vein with a little tributary with a neovascular genesis. And this is the, reflux in systole, which is very, very high speed into this neovascular genesis. There is no stump, but my conviction is that there are neovascularization is produced by a reflux from the tributaries of the groin and they contact the deep uh, vein at the groin level. So again, to, to differentiate this both, this one is the classical stump, not, not very well operated. You have a reflux from the deep vein into the left this is from, in my eyes, is not a recurrency. This is a not, not well-performed surgery. And this one is very interesting. I did a study uh, with colleagues from the university in Bochum with the president of the society. And uh, we demonstrated that um, most of the people with this neovascular genesis in the groin and with lots of, of little vessels have a reflux coming from the pelvic system. And if you look at this, this is a valsalva and the flow isn't going from the deep vein to the neovascular genesis, but from the, the, it is draining into the deep vein. So this recurrence is, into my eyes, uh, the lack of drainage of this pelvic reflux and that it tries to find a new connection to the deep vein. 
This is theory, but we only can demonstrate it if we regularly observe the patients before we operate them and document if they have um, a, a, ref a reflex from the deep vein or from the... Oh, this is interesting. We have the polling. Um, this is a good, a good answer. I treat the accessory if refluxive. This is a good option. You should treat it if refluxive. And um, if it's present, some of, some of my colleagues here in Germany close it always um, if present. And this is, I think, subject to study. Very interesting. Thank you for answering. Uh, so the recurrences after endoluminal treatment can be stratified with duplex. So if we have an axial reflux and incompetent terminal and preterminal valve, and we do close the terminal, uh, the, the great saphenous vein, and there is no accessory uh, saphenous vein present, uh, we don't have a possible reflux through the accessory vein, and we have no reflux, new, new reflux through the tributaries because they are competent. So perhaps there would be a neovasculogenesis, but as nobody analyzed this after surgery, knowing how the situation was preoperatively, we can't know if my theory that these should not have a new recurrency, we can't know. This would be interesting to know if investigated prospectively. So we have the same patient, terminal and preterminal valve, incompetent reflux through the great saphenous vein, and there is an accessory vein, but it is competent. So now we close the great saphenous vein. And it can happen that these recurrences through the accessory anterior vein are often in these cases because, yes, we have an escape point and we have a drainage path. So possibly these patients, perhaps in two or three years, we are all okay saying that we have to close them even if they are competent. The case of the paraosteal reflux in my eyes is the optimum case to do uh, endoluminal treatment. And I tell you why. If you close this vein here, you leave the reflux from the pelvic system, no other option than draining to the deep vein because this is open and this valve is competent. So you don't have any reason to find a reflux escaping here. So with no accessory anterior vein present and a reflux from the tributary, this would be an optimal result. Other, if you have an accessory vein, you might, you might, after treatment, of course, have a draining, but you might also have a new reflux into the accessory vein. So this is why I explain to all of these patients with a healthy accessory vein that I will control them regularly. And if I see a little bit of reflux, a new reflux through the accessory vein, I will immediately make a foam therapy of it. So I don't destroy this vein when it's healthy, but I always have a have an eye on it. And if, if you explain to the patient, he will not be he will not be sad. So, which is the consequence of this all this duplex on the groin? In my eyes, if you have an axial reflux and you do a, a, a surgically a surgical treatment, if you do a clinical a clean surgery, you possibly will have no no new reflux. Lots of them work very well. If you do an endoluminal treatment, the stump. I know in Germany we, we we are talking about we have to go with a with a laser just until here because we leave no stump and so on. Ulis Maurins had shown perfectly that if you close until this level, the tributaries will wash everything again and, and the stump will reappear after a period of one or two months or 12, 12 months. So is to, in my eyes, you have to close at this level because if you close er, nearer, you have a higher risk of endoluminal heat um, uh, pro progressive thrombus to the deep vein, and anyway, it will reopen. If you have a paraosteal uh, reflux, I feel like surgery is not the best option. I think in this situation, endoluminal treatment is the best option because you have a drainage of the refluxive pelvic vessels to the deep vein, and you have a competent terminal valve, and so no, no new reflux will exist. The difficulty really is in the, in the situation with the um, reflux through the accessory anterior vein, and I think our, our investigation target has to be on this 
situation? Do we have to close them always? Do we have to observe them? What do we have to tell our patients? So again, my consequence, my theory, paraosteal reflux should work better with endoluminal treatment than with surgery because you have a terminal valve that is competent, you will have no stump, no clinical stump, no reflux through a stump. But we can only evaluate all this. And I know that in my, 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 what I'm offering you is also always theory. We can only know this if we do studies documenting the finding preoperatively, because otherwise, like so, so often in medicine, we will compare apples and pears. We don't know what we had before surgery and endoluminal treatment, so we don't know the interpretation of our findings. I'm untold about it. We have um, a, a, an option, an ultrasound masterclass in September, but I'm so sad. I, I'm, I think this Congress will not happen. So if, if God helps us everybody and we have a Congress in Germany in September, we will have a masterclass and I will humbly try to do my best to have a good masterclass one day of ultrasound in English. Here is a, a book with, I wrote with Christopher Latimer and Nick Morrison. And um, I, can, I, will, I will put all this on YouTube and you can, you can have it afterwards. And there is um, another, I, I had a masterclass of, of ultrasound in Lima two years ago and we, we will put it also on YouTube in the next week. This is Spanish, of course. And this is a, a book on Safino's way in treating, depending always on the ultrasound findings. So now enough of, um, of uh, I don't know how to say this, <laughs> but this is my place where I live. I live just behind this church and we have a wonderful landscape here. And I would be so happy to meet all of you very soon. And thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, Erika. It was a very nice and splendid talk, really. We all enjoyed it. Uh, and uh, I'll tell you, we have now more than 350 uh, joining the seminar. Wow. And uh, the same number on the Facebook. Uh-huh. The Facebook. Believe or not. Wow. <laughs> That's gorgeous. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I think uh, after analyzing the anatomy and the physiology uh, of the uh, preterminal valve and terminal valve, I, I think the panel uh, have a lot of comment. Uh, uh, let me ask uh, Professor Chris uh, to give his comment. Pro Professor Rack. Hello, hello, I'm on. I, hello, everybody. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, that's good. Yes. I hope you yes. apologize if we raise a glass on you all for this great contribution about the basics of uh, valvular function, which is in fact uh, severely underestimated in, in most of the countries. And you saw from the votings that not everybody is meeting the excellent level of Erica. I hope everybody agrees to this. To know the, the valvular status is the basic of all decisions of therapy. And we will learn even more about that in future when we learn about the, the different stages of valvular damage, which is not the same for every valve. We have different, different reasons different courses, and there is so much future when we start to look at the veins. Erica, thanks a lot for this great contribution. Welcome, thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Rack. Now, uh, may I ask uh, uh, Professor uh, Orego from Chile, what do you do in Chile? Well, hello, thank you hello. very much for inviting me. And, uh, th and uh, I want to say to Dr. Erika, her uh, talk uh, has been amazing. And uh, well, I want to talk some uh, about some topics. Uh, well, I absolutely disagree about the 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 um, that the concept uh, the mapping is more important than the strategy or the, the, the technical the, the technique of the surgery. 
uh, <clears throat> we can uh, find a, a tremendous differences between uh, re results um, of uh, different surgeons with the same uh, <clears throat> uh, devices. No, you can have uh, uh, just to, uh, four or six percent of recanalization uh, at um, uh, ten years after uh, an endocclusion and a saphenous endocclusion. And uh, in other hand, you can have a very bad result, for example, 50% of recanalization after a couple of years. For instance, I think the previous venous mapping is tremendous. It is, is really, really important, but the, the technique is super important and so important than, that, than the, the mapping. And uh, I think it is very important because <clears throat> we need to have a similar uh, results uh, after our surgeries. And it means we need to understand the procedure uh, has been uh, 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 made with uh, some, some standards. Uh, in our practice, we don't use uh, 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 some uh, different maneuvers in order to, to, um, to, to, to check the reflex. We, we are using rapid cap inflation systems and it is very comfortable uh, for us. Uh, <clears throat> we really love to treat the circuits. We find uh, the wrong uh, circuits, we map that, and uh, we have a very good results if we, if we understand the meaning of the, uh, the reflux, the wrong uh, circuit. And uh, we have the technology and the, the enough tool, tools in order to treat the, the wrong circuit. Um, <clears throat> it's very important. And uh, we need to understand what it, why it's so important. When we started a long time ago, before, inclusive before, uh, before Thomas Perksley, when we started to treat perforating veins, we uh, understood that treating just the, 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 the incompetent perforator, perforator veins, it wasn't enough. We need to, to treat the, the net and the wrong circuit. And for this reason, after the endo occlusion of the perforator, vein, perforator vein, we needed to treat the net. And uh, is, it is very important. Um, um, it's very important to understand uh, that the tributaries of the <clears throat> junction, uh, the saphenofemoral junction, usually are from the, or, or drain, drain the, 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 the lower uh, abdominal wall. And uh, the connections with the deep, uh, the, the pelvic vessels are not the most uh, 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 common situation. And uh, on the other hand, uh, the neovascularization, about, about neovascularization, I think um, it's very interesting to understand when you, when, when you when th that neovascularization is the result of a, a, a chemical and a, a process a, that involves the endothelium and the and environment after a surgery. And uh, when you perform a very good endoablation, endoclusion, sorry, endoclusion of a venous, uh, saphenous vein, you have a really, really few um, uh, neovascularization. And, uh, and you can have, for example, uh, epigastric uh, superficial vein draining normally into the groin, but you don't have a new valor vascularization. And when you have reflux from the pelvis, you find a new vessels or, or, or a, a ganglion a vessels, vessels in the lymphatics. Thank you, Rego. Thank you. <laughs> Enough. Very, very, very <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Uh, I think we have uh, more than 10 questions. Uh, okay. I use the, the mic for uh, Omar. Uh, okay. And uh, uh, let us see 
I, okay. may I answer or no? Yes, yes, you can yes. answer first, yes. A very short answer. Of course, the surgeries, if you don't do a good surgery, you have lost. So of, I, I, I press upon that you will always do a good surgery. And um, these pelvic vessels, I disagree with you. They are not only from the abdomen, but that's another topic. And we can invite Roberto del Frate to ask this, answer that. And coming back to the neovascularization, I, I have never seen neovascularization after endoluminal treatment. I only see it after stripping and, and, and high ligation. So this is very different topics. So neovascularization is only after having cut there. Uh, if you do endoluminal treatment, I do it since 12 years. I've never seen this neovascularization in the groin after an endoluminal closure of the great saphenous vein. So we have to be careful not to mix the, the things. I thank you for that contribution. So, sorry. Okay, thank you very much. I will take, we have uh, 16 questions, so I will run quickly to some of them. Uh, the first question from Dr. Mendoza, Gary from Australia. He said, in your opinion, what is the difference between Doppler in transverse and longitudinal view? I think he mean regarding reflux. Um, in, the, uh, in the transverse, you, I mean, the problem with the veins is that they uh, run parallel to the skin. And so you can, in the longitudinal view, like you normally do the Doppler to the arteries, um, uh, you can only have a, a, an angle to the skin when you make the Doppler the duplex in the groin and in the popliteal um, junction, because there the vein makes this movement to, the, to, to disappear. In the cross section, which I prefer very much, you can have the transducer, um, you can tilt the transducer and so you can create an angel to, to, uh, to, to the flow. But I think the last word to how to measure the reflux uh, in transverse or longitudinal is not set. So I recommend very much to do both in the groin and in the popliteal region, just to be sure you have seen everything. I hope I, I, I got the question. Okay. And thank you for Australia. Yes, in Australia, it's, it's four o'clock in the morning, imagine. <laughs> yes, imagine, yes. We have also another question, I think, to the same point by Professor Rashad Bishara, one of the famous uh, vascular surgeons here in Egypt. He said, do you assess reflux in transverse or longitudinal view? I think it's a general school here in Egypt that will only assess reflux on longitudinal view not to the okay. transverse view, but what is your opinion or your policy? In the, in, the, in the groin, I always assess it in longitudinal. But when you go down the great saphenous vein, I think it is much more easy to do it in transverse. If you put the trans, I don't see if you see me moving because in my image I'm frozen, but you see me really doing movements? Okay. When you put yes, the transducer- no, no, no movement, yeah. On the, if you put the transducer on the skin like this and then make this, you have a good angel, angle to the, to the flow, but if you have a longitudinal view like this, the flow is parallel to the transducer and you will lose information. You know, the Doppler effect is only possible if there is an angle and the angle you can achieve it yes. moving the Doppler. And then, so in the, in, the, in the junctions, I use the longitudinal and in the transcurse of the vein, I use the cross section. Okay, we have another question from Professor Khalid al Afas. He's one of the famous intervention radiologists here in Egypt. His question is, what is the difference between systolic and diastolic reflux? Um, by definition, you never will have a systolic reflux in the great saphenous vein. You can only have a systolic reflux through perforating veins when the deep vein is obstructed. So during systole, normally the flow goes up through the, through the main veins, through the saphenous vein, through the deep veins. When you make a systole, either the vein is obstructed or you have an autograde flow. If you have a reflux in systole, you have an obstruction somewhere. But normally our patients have no obstruction, they have reflux. So in systole, you provoke a flow that is to the heart and then you observe the, the, the behavior of the blood in diastole. What happens after you have mouth the blood? You wait and you see if it goes down longer than one, one, 0 0.5 seconds, there is a reflux. If not, there is no reflux. Okay. I will take one final question from Professor Ahmed Gawish. He's also 
uh, one of the uh, very famous vascular surgeon with a special interest in venous intervention. His question is, what would you do for patient presenting with refluxing accessory um, ASV with only dilated non-refluxing great saphenoid vein? Um, I would not treat so presenting with Yes. yes, I would not treat Patient the great with refluxing. Yes, but only the accessory. Yes. I would then only treat the accessory. I mean, if it is refluxive, I would treat it. And depending on the diameter and on the amount of flow, I would do an endoluminal treatment if there is an interfascial running. And if it's tortuous or extrafascial or very thin, you can do a foam sclerotherapy. That depends a little bit on the finding. But if it's, ref if it's refluxing, no. I would treat it always in the complete setting. And if the saphenous vein is healthy, and only the accessory, I would only treat the accessory. Okay, we have the last question from China. I think uh, there is Dr. Reno Chai. He raised his hand. If uh, Dr. Khalid can put him to the podium to ask the question himself, he raised his hand. I think he's just speaking from China. Your mic is on. You can introduce yourself and ask your question. Dr. Rina Chu. Rina is from Australia. She's Chinese but lives in Australia. She's also get up at four o'clock in the morning. Thank you. Oh, okay. Very honored. Okay. <laughs> Very honored. <laughs> okay. But I don't see okay. her. Can you open your mic, Rina? Well, it, yes, she can speak now, yes. Can you, um, I'll, I'll just like to say, yeah, we are quarter to five in the morning. I just wanted to tell Erica, I'm enjoying your talk very much. It's answered a lot of my questions. I am a, um, um, a medical trained doctor from China, but now I work in Australia as a phobology sonographer. So I spend a, a lot of time scanning patients. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Welcome. So that's it, uh, Professor Ayman. Uh, the mic is back to you. Okay, thank you, Omar. Thank you, Erika. It was very interesting talk and very interesting interaction. Thank you. Now uh, it's my turn to introduce my dear friend, Mark Whitley, consultant of vascular surgery in Whitley Clinic. Uh, as a fact, uh, the name uh, Mark is always accompanied by first. He's the first man who did endovascular surgery in United Kingdom in uh, 1999. He invented the TROP procedure for treating the perforator. He is the first uh, surgeon to do microwave in Europe, February 9, uh, 9, 2019. And he is the first in United Kingdom used HIFO uh, uh, echotherapy in May. 2019. He is a member of the editorial board of Journal of Vascular Surgery, Venus and Lymphatic, and he has already published four books, and he has more than 120 <coughs> per view. Uh, really, I myself asked him to take some pictures to put uh, in my chapter in Vascular Surgery in your book. Thank you, Mark. Uh, and now he is going to talk about ablation treatment of varicose vein, thermal and non-thermal, what histology and immunochemistry has taught us about mechanism of action. Mike is yours. Thank you very uh, much, Dr. Edmund and Dr. Omar. Thank you very much for inviting me. I'm uh, thrilled to be able to talk to everybody. And I hope everybody's staying safe with this horrible COVID time we've got at the moment. Thank you also Sigvaris and Prime for putting on this tremendous time so we can meet all our colleagues even though we're all stuck at home. So today I'm going to talk to you as you've heard about ablation treatment of varicose veins and thermal and non-thermal. 
as you've heard, that most uh, you've I've been given a lovely uh, introduction by Dr. Eamon and uh, I've written some books. And we also run a thing called the College of Phlebology and we have a Venus Registry, which you're all welcome to join, where we're trying to keep uh, everybody as good as possible and get the best results because we all claim we have good results. It's nice when patients feed back through a registry and tell us whether we are giving them good results. So why do we use endovenous techniques at all? Well, as we know, the simplest form of varicose veins, we know this isn't common now, but the simplest form is of reflux in the uh, pelvic veins out through the femoral junction, if you just heard for Dr. Mendoza, down the greatest venous vein and into varicosity. And our, the main treatments that we use these days is to try and stop the reflux. We all know there are some difficult cases, but this is the basis of all varicose vein treatments. In the past, we used to use the flush suture ligation. Those of us who wanted to try and re reduce recurrences used to use non-absorbable sutures here after glasses work from, uh, from Ireland and close the fascia and we get the bruising. And as we've just heard, the trouble with this is we get not only neovascular tissue in the groin, but this normal great spin vein will grow back again in a proportion of cases and we'll see reflux coming back. About 23% of people within one year in parts, 5% total. And when we get to five years, it's about 80% between five and seven years is published. Now this was not accepted for publication in the British Journal of Surgery, but it is in my book on advances in phlebology. And this, the reason they didn't want us to publish it is many vascular surgeons were trying to create veins and grow veins for bypass grafts. And it turns out the body does this very well itself. So when we biopsy the strip drag revascularization, we find out here the scar tissue and we find these lumens. And when you take a section of the wall, it has endothelium, intima, media, adventitia, the three layers. But as you'll also notice, it has four lumens. So the histopathologist at first told us this was a normal vein until we pointed out that in fact, it may look microscopically normal, but when you actually look at the macroscopic, it is actually regrowth. So we can see that the regrowth vessels, although a bit disordered, do actually show normal vein wall histology. Now, this is the sort of reflux we see. And as I say, in our own paper that we published in Phlebology, 83% of patients had significant reflux between five and eight years after stripping. So we've left this alone, as we all know now, and we've gone on to endovenous techniques. We published back in 2001 that after radiofrequency ablation, there was no neovascularization, as you've just heard from Dr. Mendoza. And even our 15 year results that we published a couple of years ago in 2017 showed that even at 15 years, there was no neovascularization. So I agree with the comments previously that there is uh, that if you don't expose the endothelium, you don't get neovascularization. But we all know that some people have published that there is neovascularization after laser. And this is something that we published about five years ago now. And as you've just heard from Dr. Mendoza, you do get these little veins in patients who have never had surgery before. And 50% of them do come from the pelvis, but in fact, 50% also come from elsewhere. And we call these PARVA, which is the, um, the primary avalvular varicose abnormalities. And we not only see them in the groin, but you can see the popteal fossa. And you can see them in the superficial veins, and you can see them around deep veins. And if you do wish to see these more, well, there's a couple of papers we've now published on this. We know that the endothelial thermal techniques are now the, uh, the primary way of treating veins, both in America, Europe, and in the UK in the guidelines. And they call it endothermal. They obviously mean endovenous thermal ablation. Um, and that's mainly radiofrequency endovenous, although now we have steam and microwave, of course. And in 2004, I published my theory that I've been going around talking to people saying that if you want to close the veins, you must get transmural death. Up until before this, everybody used to talk about sticking the vein together with endothelium, and we know that doesn't happen. Uh, if you try to do that, you will get regrowth because the same reasons you get neovascular tissue, the endothelium, if it has media outside it, will regrow back. So I've been published in 2004, and we've been working to prove this ever since. This is the theory, and uh, this is a diagram taken from a book of leg ulcers I've written recently. Um, if you have a normal vein and you only damage the endothelium and intima, you'll get thrombosis and people will say, yes, there's no reflux, it's closed, but you will only end up with revascular recanalization. And this is why you get so many people talking and saying, well, of course, we had 90% success 
at six months, but of course it was only 80% of one year, 70% of two years. That's because it was never closed in the first place. It was only thrombus. If you do get your transmural death and you kill all the vein all the way out to the adventitia, you will get fibrosis and involution, and you will not only get a closed vein, you will get an absent vein. So if we look at the different forms of ablation, uh, radiofrequency ablation, I used to get very upset in the early 2000s going around and hearing people saying it's just like a microwave, when of course it is not. Radiofrequency ablation does not cause microwaves, it causes very low level microwaves which have no biological effect. Micro of radio frequency is an alternating electrical current in the 300 kilohertz to 3 megahertz range. The original decapitors were bipolar electrodes uh, called the closure catheters and between the front electrode and the four behind it you would get the electricity going one way through the wall and then the other way and this would alternate at radio frequency rates and that would cause the heat that caused the ablation. Uh, this was followed, a second bipolar technique, very similar, RFITT by Ceylon, later Olympus, and exactly the same thing happened here. A radio frequency catheter that set the, elect uh, the alternating current going through the wall and creating heat. And as we can see here in our porcelain liver model, we can measure the sort of burns we get from here. And you get the burns very close to the uh, electrodes and radiating outwards. But do remember, it is not a radiation, it is a contact burn from radio frequency. Now many people think they're doing radio frequency when they use catheters like this. This was the original venous closure fast called then benefit and there are several more. This is not radio frequency. What this is is it's radio frequency just like in a filament with going forwards and backwards heating that coil but there's a PTFE cover and that cover means that the radio frequency, the actual current itself, which causes the thing called the skin effect to cause the burn, does not actually penetrate the PTFE. And basically, it is just a hot poker. So you could use any sort of heat inside that, to, as long as you could control it to the 120 degrees centigrade if you want. So this is not truly radio frequency. So in my books and everything, I call this segmental radio frequency, because we must remember we don't put the electricity anywhere near the vein itself. And then we have monopolar radio frequency, where radio frequency goes from the electrode into the body and out again at radio frequency rates, again causing heat. So when we talk about radio frequency, we must remember we have, we're talking about different things. Now we've done a lot of work looking at the LED. Do remember with linear endovenous energy density, a lot of people think this is restricted only to um, laser, but in fact, you can use it for any sort of uh, endovenous energy or thermal ablation. And we use the porcelain liver model. And what we've shown is if you use the sorts of powers that people used to talk about, where you use high powers, but very quickly, you get inadequate burns. And if you slow it down high power to try and get a better penetration of the heat, all that ends up happening is you get charcoal. And we published this, if you want to read this, Badham, who is one of my uh, research fellows and myself published this in Phlebology. And what we showed is when we looked at the original bipolar RFITT device, if you want to get your burn out to about 0 0.6 to 0 0.7 of a millimeter, which means the whole of the vein wall, if you use the company recommended 80 or 20 watts and pull it back at one centimeter per second, uh, so one second per centimeter, which is what was in the uh, European paper, you don't get adequate closure. In other words, what happens is you only burn about three quarters the way across the wall. And that's why they had a reopening rate of, nine, uh, of uh, 8% and only a closure of 92%. And of course, they had to exclude the bad results just to get that. However, if you use the same device, but you just decrease the powers slowly, you get the same LED, but what you do is you take longer to pull it back. You get much better trans, uh, transmural uh, energy transfer all the way, even when you get to 72 uh, LED, you can keep the same LED, but by reducing power and doing, taking it longer, you can get different biological effects. And this is a really important thing to remember. So is this just theory or does it work? Well, we did some ex vivo human uh, great saphenous vein work. And this is a control vein here. This one over here was six watts, giving us uh, 12 seconds per centimeter. Um, 72 joules uh, per centimeter is the LED, totally six watts for 12 seconds per centimeter, you multiply those together and you have death of the whole vein wall. Whereas if you use the company recommended 18 watts, 
to try and get the same LED, you have to slow it down to four seconds per centimeter, which still only burns the intima. And more than that, you get charcoalization. So the same LED gives different biological results depending on how fast you pull it back and what power. And this is what I published in our Advances in Phlebology and Venus Surgery book, showing that when you talk about LED, it's inadequate just to talk about the LED itself. Each one of these lines is an LED. For instance, this blue line here, this is 60 LED. So 60 watts at one second per, per centimeter, or 30 watts at two seconds per centimeter, or 20 watts at three seconds per centimeter. You can get the same LED for different powers and different pullbacks, judging by this graph. And of course, we don't want to get charcoal. And so if we don't want to get charcoal, we don't want to go over about 15 watts. If we don't want to, we don't want to pull back more than about 12 seconds per centimeter. We don't want to have a, we don't want to go under a certain LED or else we won't close the vein at all. And we won't want too much pain. So because of that, we have only a certain number of LEDs that will actually close our veins. So whenever you write a paper or you write some notes on a patient, whenever you ever use the LED, you must quote which power you used or which pullback, or else you're not actually making an adequate note. Nobody can see exactly which one of these different points you use, or even a point out over here. So remember, when you write an LED, use the power or pullback. Now, last week we had an excellent talk um, by Ravel uh, Jindral from India about laser. And I'm not going to go through that again because he really gave a masterclass on lasers. And just to point out that the different lasers, as we know, have different chromophores. So the 1470 really interacts with water, whereas the 810 interacts with hemoglobin or melanin. But of course, for endovenous work, it's the, uh, it's the um, hemoglobin we're looking at. So we developed an ex vivo model where we harvested the extrafascial great venous vein or dominant tributary if you prefer. We tied it either end of a solution where we had a culture medium inside it, passed lasers or radio frequency, whatever we were looking at, into this. We then put adrenaline and lignocaine over it so that it looked exactly the same as the um, uh, looked exactly the same as what we would get inside the body. Now, some people have been putting blood into this as well, but in patients we've been measuring, in fact, our patients are 15 degrees head down with a lot of tumescence. And when we've done ultrasound, there is no blood flow in that vein at all. So therefore, this, is, this represents our practice. If you use a flat table, it may not represent yours, but this is the sort of standard way of exsanguinating a vein. When we then looked at endovenous laser, we first of all looked at 8, 10 nanometers versus 14, 17 nanometers. And this is just the MSB staining. And in MSB staining, blue is normal and red shows fibrosis. Now, as we can see over here in the control, we have normal vein. If the 810 nanometer, 60 joules per centimeter, and that's 10 watts, you can see very little change over here at all. However, when we go up to, when we do the 1470, it's exactly the same LED at 10 watts again. You can see you get a good burn, although because it's end firing, a little asymmetric. We then looked at immunocytochemistry because it's one thing to say you have fibrosis, but what you really want to know is do you have destruction? So we then used uh, a smooth muscle antigen. And what this shows is this stains for smooth muscle that is still living at the point when the vein was sectioned. So this is control with lovely smooth muscle, all brown stains all the way through, right out to the media, right from the intima out to the media and out tissue. At 40, all of these were done at 10 watts. At 40 joules per centimeter, you can see quite a lot of disruption here at 8 to 10 nanometers. So even though the MSB didn't show much, we can see disruption and a bit more disruption here at 60 joules per centimeter. Again, 10 watts. But look at the difference for the 1470. Complete destruction and disorientation of all the fibers all the way out, um, both at 40 watts and also 60 watts. And at 60 watts, we can see almost going through the vein wall over here. Now, if we look at the C3 staining, when we're looking at cells, cells are either necrosed and die straight away. That's like having an egg and just boiling it. It's the proteins or denature and they're dead straight away or they're injured and they're going to die within 24 to 48 hours. And when that happens, it's a process called apoptosis. 
And apoptosis we can look at by looking at when the caspase C3 is expressed. When that's expressed, that cell will definitely die. Now, when we look in a control, there's a little bit of apoptosis out over here, and that's just because of handling the vein, but the rest of the vein is quite healthy and alive. At the 8-10 nanometers, at 40 joules per centimeter, we can see a lot of this brown staining apoptosis around here, and even more when we go to 60 joules per centimeter, right to the outside. So although we don't see huge amounts of necrosis or the other stains with, uh, for the 810 nanometer laser, we do still get a closure, as Min showed us many years ago, because of apoptosis more than necrosis. Now in the 1470, you don't see any of it. And the reason is that vein is already dead. As you saw on the SMA in the last slide, these cells are already dead, they're necrosed, and so therefore they don't express caspase C3. So what's the difference between a jacket tip and a radial tip in the EVLA? So if we use 1470 nanometers on the same and the same powers, but the, just the only difference being the tips, you can see on the MSB control here on the left, in the middle, this is what we get with a jacket tip. It's eccentric. You've got carbonization here, which leads to pain. It's over to the side. And if that actually goes through, of course, we'll get your ecchymosis or bruising. Whereas the radial tip, look at that. There you get a lovely symmetrical uh, burn all the way around. And so it's very homogeneous. And this is exactly what you'd expect. Again, if you want to look at that, the SMA, we see the same fibers here. This is uh, the same pattern, rather. This is the control. Uh, 40 joules per centimeter, 10 watts, uh, some disruption with forward firing fiber and more at 80. And again, the same over here on the radio. And once again, over here, you can see once we get up to 80 joules per centimeter, we've got charcoal and we've almost got penetration through the wall. Sorry. Uh, whereas if we actually look at the radial at the same 80 joules per centimeter, we've got total transmural death. That vein is definitely going to go away. Um, but we have absolutely no charcoal at all that we can see and certainly no risk of uh, perforating. Um, if we look at the uh, alpha uh, P53, this is the precursor. This is the thing just before caspase C3, so it's almost the same. It is possible for a cell to come back from uh, expressing phosphorylated P53 and not go to C3, but not really in veins, it's rare. So we can look at this as if it was C3. Again, in the control, just a couple of cells showing this because we've handled it. And again, forward firing, we can see quite a lot um, of uh, the P53 expressed. And when we get to the 80 joules per centimeter, the area of the vein where it almost came through the wall is completely necrosed. There's absolutely none of the brown staining over here. But on the other side, which wasn't dead, it's going to die because of apoptosis. So at 80 joules per centimeter, we're still going to get a good result, but just in a less refined way and charcoal formation, which is wasting energy. Whereas with the radial fibers, we get a bit of apoptosis at 40 joules per centimeter, 10 watts, but we get total death at, uh, at 80 joules per centimeter, which is, sticks with what we know clinically. Now, when we compare that with radio frequency, we find that well, there's a slight difference in the actual pattern, but the reality is it's almost the same. Good radio frequency, when it's applied to the vein wall, will give you the same amount of apoptosis and cell death as a radial laser. So what else is new and what can, what can we take this, knowing now roughly what we're looking for? We're looking for apoptosis or necrosis, and we're looking for transmural death. We've got the endovenous microwave, which is come from Echo in China, and we can see we've got a very, very similar pattern of uh, destruction as we have with the other endovenous thermal ablation. The one thing is with this is it is a true electromagnetic microwave and that radio frequency, it's not contact. And so just like as you beam into your chicken or whatever you're cooking in your microwave at home, this actually heats the tissue away. So like laser, you don't have to be in contact with the, with the actual wall of the vein. So this is laser and microwave, you don't have to be in contact with the same as steam. With, micro, with radio frequency, that's the one you have to have some contact with the vein wall. Uh, we did the microwave, as you all know, and we were very fortunate one of our celebrities decided to have this and then went for a run, a uh, nine kilometer run the next day, which uh, was not what we recommended, but it, he's got a good result. Now, when it comes to sclerotherapy, what we all know from what's been published before, um, Ken Myers wrote uh, some time ago in the, uh, from, uh, from Australia, 
and we all know that sclerotherapy works better in small veins than in big veins and we tried to work out why that was although we thought we knew already and we tried these different stains which didn't help until we went to immunocytochemistry when we use immunocytochemistry we can use fluorescent antibodies here the red ones for the endothelium cd31 and alpha actin here the green ones showing the living smooth muscle cells the blue flecks are the nuclei that's a healthy vein wall after 3% SDS, you can see what happens. The, this living healthy wall, we destroy a lot of the endothelium, we destroy a lot of the vein wall. But when we actually then look at it in 50 micron aliquots, this is endothelium, CD31, and this is coming out here away from the wall. And we can see that by the time we're getting into about 200 microns, there is no further death. So this is only transmural death if the vein wall is less than 200 microns. In other words, it's not the small vein that matters, it's the thin vein wall of small veins, which means this is why our radiologist colleagues tell us that they can use foam in venous abnormalities, even when it's 50 or 60 millimeters, because they have very thin walls. So we must get away from talking about vein diameter, and we must talk about vein thickness. And this is just a bit more proof of how it works. The P53 and also the ICAM-1 inflammation showing in a normal vein here and showing once again that both the apoptosis and the, and the um, inflammation, cellular inflammation of both show the same pattern out to about 200 microns. So this is why we shouldn't be using foam in our truncal veins unless we have some special way of doing it because it doesn't really work and we don't get transmural death. But in small veins, it's excellent. So this is where, again, uh, published in our book recently, thick wall veins, if you only use foam sclerotherapy and only get intermal death and don't work out some way of getting uh, media death, you will get recanalization, which is what we see in the studies. Whereas in the small vein walls, you actually get transmural death and fibrosis. So it's the same sort of idea. How does MOCA work then, Clarivane or the new Flebogriff? And the reason that works is because you're actually ripping the vein wall. And this is histology showing this. We won a prize at the American College of Pathology for this work, showing that in the normal vein wall here, not only do you get endothelial damage, which people will talk about, but you actually get media damage here from the, the shearing stress of turning the inside of the vein against the outside. And this acts like a Swiss cheese, so the sclerosin can get deep into the vein wall, and that way your 200 microns starts from deep in the vein wall. This is your normal uh, surface uh, sclerotherapy here and this is what happens when you've used mocha and once again when you actually look at this you can see this significant increase of cell wall death after mocha and also increased depth of endothelium right out to about 400 500 microns which is why claravane works in truncal veins much better than foam alone with glue we can't talk too much about it because we did some work under an nda um, but it does damage the endothelium and then it damages, it works in a completely different way. You do get um, transmural death, but from foreign body reaction, it's not a cell death. And I don't really want to talk too much more about that because we did it under an NDA and we're repeating the work ourselves. This is the latest thing, the high intensity focused ultrasound. It's got two components. The first is the ultrasound to image, and this is what the image looks like on the right. And this is the great saphenous vein here in the fascia with the skin at the top. And this is just a little bit of local anesthetic, both to localize it so we can see it. It's an awful lot less. It's about a tenth of the amount to a twentieth of the amount of volume that we'd use for tumescence. Then you fire the high foo, the high intensity focus ultrasound, and this dome here focuses all the ultrasound to one point. And that point's about five millimeters high and 3.5 millimeters across. You see this pattern on the right hand side where the bubbles are formed from the thermoablation actually in the tissue, you get a reflection and you don't from the local anesthetic either side. And immediately afterwards, you see this vein here, and this is an ablated vein. When you see that picture, you know that that vein is ablated. And what, how does that, well, we're coming up with some histology at the moment, and I don't have that to show you yet because we haven't published it, um, but we're starting to work on it. But basically this is what happens. As a high food comes in and goes out, you get this zone of destruction. And the beautiful thing of this, and what's different about HIFU than any of the other techniques I've talked about, is all of the other techniques start at the intima and have to work their way out. And so all the physics we look at in biology is how do we get the destruction from the intima to the outside? It's, got, it's a combination of power and time. 
The lovely thing with Haifu is you're actually already putting that energy right across from Adventitia to Intima and from Intima to Adventitia all at one go. And this is why I'm so excited about this as a sort of form of thermal ablation. Not the fact, it, I mean, the fact it's non-invasive is even better, it's from outside the body. But the, but the, the biology of it is very elegant because we should get fibrosis and involution. I can't believe that we won't get excellent results. So in conclusion, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Omar and Dr. Eamon again for inviting me, but uh, I think this is what my, I've sort of done for the last 20 years. And I think the most important thing is never cut a vein if you can help it, and never expose the endothelium. Try always to get transmural death of the vein wall, and I don't mind if you use chemicals, if you use heat, whatever you use, as long as the biological principles work. Don't get thrombus inside if you're going to leave any living media or adventitia or even uh, endothelium because that's the disaster for getting your regrowth. If you use thermoablation, remember, it's not only the power that's important, you also have to not have an optimal time of application. So understand your biology and physics as well when you're getting the best results. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It is very interesting talk and really I think will deviate uh, our thoughts to many things. Uh, as you uh, told us, uh, the transmural death uh, depends on the vein uh, wall thickness. And I think uh, I will ask uh, Dr. Erwin uh, Tudner from Netherlands. Uh, do you think, Dr. Erwin, uh, in your uh, practice and in doing duplex, do you think you have to pay more attention for the vein wall thickness after this uh, lecture? <laughs> With ultrasound to look at the vein wall uh, is not really that relevant. So, uh, uh, thank you very much, Mark. I found it a wonderful presentation as usual. Thank you. Um, uh, but what we should realize, and I think that he made a very relevant point when we we're talking about the lead. If I was to say, because I saw one of the questions regarding nerve damage, but if you were performing your, uh, your, your endovenous term ablation, whatever technique you're using, uh, if you were to protect the nerve mark, would you say, if you were to use a, an energy of say a, a lead of 60, would you go for the, the short term six second 10 watt, or would you go for the slower 10 second six watt? Because that's the kind of discussion that people would try and say to prevent nerve damage, even if they're using the, the same lead, which people are using in publications, and causing this misunderstanding because they say, we're only using 60 and we're not getting any nerve damage. And then you're looking at the wattage and then you're saying, yes, well, how come this guy does have nerve damage? What would your preference be if you were treating the small saphenous vein? Uh, that's an as always, that's an excellent question. And I think the most important thing we should always be trying to do is we should think about the physics in whole. And so you want to use the highest power you can use that's going to give you a transmural death, because that way it is the highest power, be the shortest possible, and you'll get less spread towards the nerve. So obviously we want to try and push the nerve away with tumescence. I don't believe that works for skin, by the way, but for nerves it does, because it's short term. You push it away um, in the short term, you use the highest possible power, so I'd use the 10 watts and six, seconds not the six watts and ten seconds but also do remember the other point that's very very important you've also got to think about the length of power because if you've got a radial laser or microwave that's sort of like two millimeter ring or maybe one centimeter the zone of heating is actually not very far but if you're putting a seven centimeter device up that is 120 degrees centigrade you're going to get much more thermal spread and so it's not just the power and the time in that case it's also the length of application and so we have to we have to always think in three dimensions with this so power time and also what the source is what the shape is for the expansion of the heat so that's why i personally we, we um, i don't know if we had published in the end but at one stage we did look at using segmental ablation in the small sphenous vein and found yes it's successful if you use the right led etc but um the the risk of um loss of sensation you know even transit was much higher so so that's why we we moved away from that but yes i mean it all at the end of the day it all comes down to physics right so it's always that so the highest possible highest possible power as short as possible time without getting charcoal Yes. Well, uh, sorry to, to uh, avoid the question about looking with ultrasound at the, the venous wall, but I don't think, you know, uh, when it comes to ultrasound, 
that we're going to add anything. I think the mapping, as Erica explained, is far more important. I think, well, I, I think actually you probably might do it subconsciously in any case. And I know that we did some early work and then, of course, Nikos Lepropopoulos did a really lovely study showing that, in fact, you can look uh, with ultrasound. And I mean, if you have a very thick vein wall, if you've got a 10, centim a 10 millimeter vein, but it's got a very thickened wall, you're probably going to use a higher LED for that point. You're probably going to slow down or use a bit more to the temperature. Whereas if you had a very thin blowout, you might not. So you might be doing it subconsciously consciously just on the look of it i mean at the moment if you're using we, we the leds we're using aren't precise enough to worry too much because we're all over treating a bit to get good results but i think you know at the same day the same way you know it's just a mass of cells that we're heating in the same way that when we want to cook a steak or a chicken you know we will weigh it first and know how much energy we're going to put in so that's that it really does get important if we wanted to get to the pure science but Mark, if, uh, if I look at a vasospasm, you'll have a thick wall and I wouldn't think that you would be tempted to, to adapt your power if you get a vasospasm, just because you see a thick wall. You know? uh, but you're not seeing a thick wall with vasospasm. What you're seeing is seeing a normal wall in a vasospasm. And that's why I argue with the, the, back in the days of foam sclerotherapy, when people said, uh, you can use uh, the foam sclerotherapy works in a three millimeter vein, but it doesn't work in a 10 millimeter vein. So just make the patient cold. And of course, that's ridiculous because in that case, a three millimeter vein into the vasus spasm is a 10 millimeter vein out of the vasus spasm. So that's yeah. where we have to think about the difference. You know, what are we talking about is vein wall versus diameter. So if, if you if you are getting to a thick wall, but only in vasus spasm, you know, either measure it then and work out what it would have been, but, but the key to it always is going to come down to what's the thickness of the wall. I'm okay, Mark. Dr. Suat Duganji, uh, yeah. who, did a, who did a paper on, on uh, uh, small softness vein treatment on, uh, on related to nerve damage. What do you think of the, the, the lead, Dr. Duganji, professor? Uh, okay, uh, I, I will ask uh, the question for uh, Denis Poroska. Roska, uh, till we bring uh, Dr. Uh, Swat on the mic. Uh, Dennis, I think you have uh, uh, made some research on the vein wall thickness. Uh, can you tell us more about this? Dennis, uh, please. Oh, yes. Uh, do you hear me? Do you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. we can hear you. Yes. Thank you, Mark, for this uh, fantastic talk. So, uh, as you know, we also have done uh, some study about this. So, if I can uh, just uh, share for a second uh, my screen. Can, it's, is it possible? Do you see my screen? Yes, we can see your screen. Yeah, because, uh, yes, because we also measured uh, in, with different power, but uh, the same lead. And we had difference between venous wall damage from 55% from 10 watts to uh, 50 25% on 5 watts. It was the same lead, but different power. So, and uh, you know, I want to tell just about one disadvantage of all these studies, because of course, when we have uh, damage right here and we see it on uh, our simple histology, we don't know what's going on here on this part. And Mark showed us brilliantly uh, that it could be also different changes here with immune histochemistry. Uh, we couldn't do this, but Mark showed us that uh, what could be uh, in our so real uh, life, so the damage close to the fiber can be the output of biologically act active substances and starting of inflammation and apoptosis process. But the problem of this investigation is that we need to do this in different time period because if we measure all of this in ideal study you know we will see all of these things which you can see here from mark whitely studies so uh, it could be uh, change it could it can be changes uh, in a different time period so we can have uh, not uh, not transmural deaths in the second postoperative day but we could have it uh, on the seventh for for example post-operative day uh, day so i can uh, show you this quite a good interesting paper uh, which uh, explain a lot of uh, things uh, how it works so and uh, you know 
Um, and in our study, we started to measure uh, clinically uh, post-operative pain and uh, occlusion rate. And we didn't find difference between all of these three groups uh, with, uh, you know, with uh, pain and um, occlusion rate. So, of course, Mark showed us how, uh, the explanations of uh, dying of muscle cells and other things of uh, venous wall, but uh, it's uh, quite difficult to find the best settings uh, to have some better clinical results because, uh, you know, uh, it's uh, impossible to organize ideal investigation and to, uh, you know, find that these best settings in clinical part because we have already very low pain syndrome. We have pain syndrome, our median of pain syndrome was zero. So we had uh, median of pain level uh, zero, <laughs> approximately zero. So uh, you need so many patients to find difference between different settings. As this is the biggest disadvantages of all of this. And uh, so I also want again, thanks Mark, because he opened our eyes in this uh, part of, uh, you know, uh, in this part of vein, uh, what's going on there, but uh, the biggest problem is uh, in my, that in, in my opinion, this in the Venus methods uh, reached their peak. So it's impossible to do something better with the best, better occlusion rate because it's already too high and uh, to find better settings to uh, reduce the pain syndrome because it's also very low. So this is my comment and thank you, Mark, again for your study. Uh, you're only one person who did such a good studies in uh, immune histochemistry and morphology of pain wall after uh, ablation. Uh, I think uh, Dr. Swat is ready now. Thank you, Dennis. It was a very interesting comment. Uh, Swat, uh, are you ready? Yes, uh, I am ready. And uh, first of all, I also want to thank you, Dr. Mark Whiteley, because it was a very excellent presentation. And also the comments of uh, Irwin and uh, Dennis was perfect. So. Uh, we know that the vein wall is important uh, to have a good, uh, let's say, result after whatever you do. If you ablate the vein wall in a perfect way, you have a good result. So we can, as Dennis also explained, we don't know how much uh, power we need or how much did we need exactly to have a per perfect vein wall ablation. And it is also really difficult to measure uh, with, with duplex, so you cannot uh, make a, per, let's say, perfect uh, balance between your technique, whatever you do. But uh, for, for example, uh, just to raise a question and just make a, a quick understanding, for example, the post-thrombotic veins. So we know that after such a superficial vein thrombosis, some, uh, the vein walls increasing. So in, for example, such type of post-thrombotic veins, maybe the, due to the vein wall thickness, maybe we can need some higher energy to have a full uh, ablation of the vein, vein wall. So I think uh, for such type of uh, diseased vein walls and normal vein walls, if we can make a, some study maybe to show uh, how it is changing, it can make us, uh, let's say, easy to understand what is changing or not. So it can be, I think, a good idea to have such type of uh, studies to see, but uh, uh, whatever technique you use, uh, it is important to ablate the vein wall. And to, uh, when I come to the earlier question, uh, in our study, which we published European Journal in 2011, to, to show the uh, postoperative neurologic disturbances after small saponous vein ablation, uh, at that time, we, we made that if you make your, uh, let's say, puncture about at the mid-calf level, we, we saw that we decreased the uh, amount of postoperative neuro neuropathies. But I, when we, it was in, you know, it was nine years ago, so we now m more, a lot of things now about the effects of uh, thermal ablation and the other things. And I think not only the, uh, ablation technique or whatever you, wherever you puncture the vein, I think when we come to the solution, I think the tumescent anesthesia is uh, becoming much more uh, important uh, in your technique. So this is my comment. Thanks for everybody. Uh, thank you, Swat. Nice comment. And I think uh, Raul Jindal, uh, Dr. Raul, uh, I saw you raising your hand. Uh, 
Uh, you have a comment? Uh, yeah, I wanted to ask Mark, Mark, a wonderful lecture. You know, the basic thing is we are discussing about transmural death. We all know that it's going to give us a very good result. Now, the question is, in practical form, how do we achieve that? You see, Mark, you said uh, we use 10 watts for six seconds. It's better than if we use the other way around. So uh, like when we do in practical sense, do we do it for, let's say eight into 10? So we use an eight watt for 10 seconds as compared to 10 watts to six seconds. Does it make a difference? So do, think... we know, do we know the answer to this question? Because in practical sense, um, how exactly we measure intraoperatively transmural death. Then another thing is that we also know that as the age grows, uh, all the veins, what we're talking about ablation is a short softness vein and the long softness. They respond differently to the long standings. There have been studies published, I, uh, I went through it, that if you look into the diameter of the vein wall, it becomes thinner in the older patients as compared to uh, if you're treating the varicose veins in the middle-aged people. So when we treat older patients, so then we should decrease the laser power because we want to deliver less energy because the transmural uh, that which we want is much lesser than the middle-aged. I think there's a couple of things to say about that, and I think this is why research is so interesting, why you have to go on. Um, the answer, I didn't say 10 watts is better than, and six seconds better than six watts and 10 seconds, only when we were talking about thermal spread for, for nerves. I think where, where I'm coming from is when we started doing this research, we still had a lot of phlebologists who were telling us, and there's still, if you go in the world of phlebology, you will still hear sclerotherapists telling you that you kill a vein because you destroy the endothelium, you stick it together. And you will still hear people saying that an LED of 20 is quite adequate. And so, you know, these are, these are the things that my research was all based upon to show that, no, it's not the science behind it. Now, when you get to people who are getting, I mean, we're just about to submit for publication our two year results of closure of um, great spinous veins of 100%. Um, and the, if you look at the smallest bit of opening at the top, 98%, uh, with 2% failure. And that's also what we found in a radio frequency that we published. As long as you use the, uh, what is a sensible and proven protocol, I don't think it matters too much if it's six watts, eight watts, 10 watts, as long as you end up with a, an LED of about 60 to 80, we know more than that's going to hurt unless there's exceptional circumstances. So I think the whole th concept is I don't think we have to be that precise, but we use these understandings firstly so we don't get the bad results. The people who are still saying 20 joules per centimeter is enough, where well, that's clearly rubbish. Um, and also we have to look at the new techniques. So people who are using foam and laser together or these are, you have to turn around and say, it's not good enough to say, here's a whole lot of patients, some of whom came back and see me. You have to turn around and say, that's no problem. Can you just explain the biology? How's it working? Just show us how your new magical technique is working. Then we can all understand it. And that's, I think all of these things that we're seeing being developed, we have to just hold them up to the science that we already know. Um, whether you can measure it interoperatively is very interesting. There has been a very, very good talk from Erwin Mohan uh, from Australia, who's been looking at the straight after the operation as to whether there's still blood flow in the adventitia with very high resolution duplex. And showing if you've got no blood flow in the adventitia afterwards, you've ablated it. And so therefore it's going to close. So that might be a possibility. I mean, I don't suppose, I don't think we should all be doing that, but I think it's a very good way of saying, yes, this, you know, this sort of thought process is the correct way to do it. And when we're then assessing new devices, HIFU or, you know, do new combination devices, we then use that as some form of measuring way of doing it along with the histopathology. I think your comment about age is really interesting. I don't have an answer because I haven't yet um, studied that. The worry I would have of turning around and saying, yes, you can use a lower power is, is there more fibrosis in the vein wall? Because it might not have the same properties as the thicker vein in a younger person. So I, I, in that one case, and I think that's where, you know, more research is needed. I think we have to be careful and just say, we, you know, we might not be looking at exactly the same biological response to heat. I totally agree in the, in the last end, like because you see, I didn't came across a paper where people have majored. Is there a difference in the water uses in the middle case and in the older people? 
another thing was uh, you know i didn't want uh, is there any publications on the bubbles you see while i am doing the laser now i'm using the wattage you know what i think is right but at the same time on ultrasound i'm watching the bubbles which you can see on ultrasound at least trying that the bubbles goes into the uh, you know pass the intima into the media you know while i'm doing it because what we have done you know we have seen that the bubbles they go approximately around 2 cm approximately uh, and then they deliver the heat into the vein wall so i'm working on that principle where i read the all the physics and then from last one year i have been working on an ultrasound and seeing these bubbles and i don't know what will be the results in the follow up in 2 to 3 years does it will make a difference or not so i'm using a continuous pull out watching these bubbles going down and seeing so i just wanted to know is there any studies published on that you know uh, there's quite a lot of there's quite a lot of work i believe that was done um especially when there were um there was a lot of uh, court cases in america and then doing the surgery and a lot of things were brought out from laser physics my understanding is that uh i've only seen some of the research and not read the whole papers but my understanding is if you work out the total energy transfer that you can get from all the visible bubbles it's not enough to cause the thermal damage so the bubbles is only a marker of some of the energy and actually is not the the the, the, the primary energy the primary energy is probably the protein denatured within the wall and things going so the free bubbles that you're saying is only a very small part plus if you use microwave for instance although that's acting on water you won't see any bubbles at all because all the bubbles are inside the cells and so you see no bubbles at all but you get fantastic histology results fantastic clinical results and very little pain so so because it's a different heat distribution so i, I think we have to be careful that when observing bubbles i think is probably all that will tell us is you know yes there's still some flow where it's going but it's not actually where the heat distribution necessarily is Thank you, Mark. Thank you very much, and thank you, Raoul, for this interesting uh, comment. Uh, I think uh, we have a few questions, and I will leave the mic for uh, Omar. Uh, we have some okay. questions. Uh, yes, we have uh, we have plenty of questions. I think, but because of sake of time, we'll take a few of them. Um, Dr. Ahmed Gawish, he has a question. I think uh, if we can open his mic. Uh, Dr. Ahmed Gawish, one of the well-known uh, philobologists in Egypt. You can speak, Dr. Uh, Ahmed. Hello. Uh, hello. Can you hear me? Yes, we yes, can hi, hear you. Yes, yes. Okay. okay, great. Uh, thank you, Dr. Omar. Thank you, Dr. Ayman, for uh, for this lovely uh, session of uh, very hot session with uh, with Mark Whiteley speaking in it. Uh, it's really uh, great to see you, Mike. Mark. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> and I hope you're staying safe, my dear. Bye. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you for a very interesting presentation indeed. Uh, I have two questions for you. Uh, the Hello? Yes, you can speak, Dr. Yeah. Ahmed. Yes, yeah. you can speak. Yeah. The, the, my, my first question is about it's, uh, the, 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 the theory of uh, transmural death of the vein. It's a it's pretty interesting concept. Uh, however, um, when you when you when you showed us the histological uh, changes that happens with different modalities, uh, I think when when we're talking about for the for example the closure fast catheters, uh, which we've been using a lot, and actually when 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 we bring our patients for follow up, uh, we we routinely do that on a first week basis, and then to to make sure that the pain is closed, and then when we when we bring our patients later for follow-up when you do a duplex scan, you find that actually involution has happened and you can barely see the vein. Although that might not be um, pretty uh, coinciding with the transmural death because the closure fast is, as you said, as you mentioned, it's a hot stick inside the vein. So how would you interpret such, such a thing? Because uh, actually we get the final result which, and clinical, clinically perfect result and involution of the vein on the long term However, we're not quite, quite sure about the transmural death happening with uh, closure fast. That's my first question. Uh, the second question is, uh, I noticed in the presentation that you, you had HIFU uh, done with tumescent anesthesia. Uh, so uh, is that, uh, what, what I actually, what we all actually understand is that HIFU is the new, the, the new 
uh, era of non-invasive treatment of varicose veins. Um, so if, um, I wonder if that is a change of things going that it would need also tumescence. Maybe you can give us an insight about that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you very much. I, I, I must have, I might, might not have been clear because I was trying to get a lot of information out. The, the radiofrequency closure fast is still thermal ablation. It just is you need contact, just the same that if you put your frying pan or heat on the gas ring, it's contact, but the heat still goes through. So it's still transmural death. It's still transmural death. And um, one of the histology slides I showed was radio frequency versus radio laser showing that provided the radio frequency is touching the vein wall, it's exactly the same as radio laser. It's just as good as radio laser. So, so the, you will get involution because if you're using closure fast, they've worked out the number of cycles. And if you use two cycles or three cycles, certainly you will always get involu involution because you're going to kill that vein wall, provided you've got good um, contact. The one cycle might not be quite enough in some of the veins. So, so I, I'm sorry if I made that, uh, if I didn't get that quite clear, but it is still transmural death because it's heat and it's transferred across. The second thing, the HIFU, um, uh, what I showed is uh, the, the, the bit of vein that you can see very, very clearly because I put some local anesthetic around it. That's not tumescence. Tumescence is when you put a lot of fluid around with local anesthetic in and you use 200 mils, 300 mils, 400 mils. With this, we're using two mils, three mils, four mils of concentrated, very concentrated local anesthetic in patients who have got pain. Um, in our practice, we tend to use it also just enough, just around the adventitia, just to show where the vein is, because it gives better contrast. And those two reasons, it makes it more comfortable. But we're using a tiny needle. We're actually using an orange needle, which is only a, what's that, a 27 um, gauge. And we're using it under pressure, under the HIFU heat, which, uh, under the HIFU head, which is also cold. So the patients don't even feel it. So this is, is holes apart. It's completely different from tumescence, which we know is now one of the most painful parts of an endovenous procedure. Because as Dennis said, there's so little pain now associated with endovenous surgery. And I quite quote, I quite, I quite agree with Dennis. You know, those of us who are getting 98 to 99% closure rates at one, two, three, four, five years in the involution, you can't get much better. We do need something new. What we're still trying to do is we're trying to get, if you look at the randomized controlled studies that people still quote, saying that endovenous surgery is the same as stripping, that's just because the people doing endovenous surgery were so terrible. The results were awful. And those results need to be done better by people who are good at endovenous surgery. And then the randomized studies would not show the ridiculous thing that stripping is just as good. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, that is great. I think because of sake of time and because we have our next eminent speaker, Dr. Tujun, speaking from Singapore, and we are very sorry to keep him late, but he's very kind. So it's back to you, Dr. Ayman, uh, to take over. Thank you, Omar. Thank you, Mark. It was a very interesting uh, session. I like it very much. I think all of uh, in these like it uh, very much. It was very attractive and in interactive too. Now, uh, it's a uh, great honor to introduce uh, Mr. Tajin uh, uh, Tang, uh, a senior consultant of vascular surgery at uh, Singapore General Hospital. Uh, he's a fellow of Royal College of Edinburgh and Glasgow. He graduated uh, and trained in Cambridge and got his medical doctorate in Cambridge. Cambridge uh, he has training in vascular surgery in uh, Lister uh, Royal Infirmary Hostel in United Kingdom. Uh, in, uh, when he moved to Singapore, he focused uh, to build a portfolio of academic vascular interests. And uh, believe it or not, he has more than 200 reviews. A big number. Has uh, some specialty in uh, diabetic food, dialysis access, and uh, superficial and deep vein surgery. Uh, now he is going to talk on how to microwave varicose veins the way I do it. Thank you, Dr. Tang, and the mic is you with you now. Please go ahead. Thank you, Dr. Alman. Can you hear me? Yes, sure. Good, good morning. It's uh, about three of us nearly heading towards four o'clock in Singapore. So first of all, my apologies if I sound a bit tired. Um, 
I want to thank yourself and Dr. Omar for actually the kind invitation and uh, to Sigvaris and to Prime for hosting this uh, wonderful meeting and always uh, following on from Mark, it's always a very hard, uh, hard act. But I hope that this talk is going to be more, slightly more practical with leading on very nicely from the basic science of how microwave works. So all, my talk, all of my talk is very much picture based and I hope that uh, it comes across quite clearly on this iPad. So just as an introduction, I mean, obviously the recommendations remain uh, from the SVS and the AVF and from NICE that the first recommendation for, for ablating the truncal vein, however you do it, is probably thermal based. And whether you use laser or RFA uh, is not, a, it's not really a question because there's very good data based on both efficacy, safety and quality of life outcomes. And ultimately, what we're trying to do is to minimize the, the, the pain, uh, painful experience of the patient uh, and ultimately uh, optimize that outcome in the long run. So basically, a closed, ablated, a transioaxial vein is good, however you accomplish it. So these are the kind of categories that we, uh, we are all familiar with now and very much in the thermal category. Most people use laser, radio frequency. Steam in the, in the Far East is not really available at all, to be honest with you. And microwave is just beginning to use in Singapore. In terms of the non-thermal techniques, and I think this has really grown and burgeoned in the last five years. And in the Far East, a lot of patients actually prefer this and really is led by the light of cyanoacrylate glue and um, mocha. Basically, we're using the clary vein device. Uh, just to say that in Singapore, we are very blessed to be able to get access to most of the devices very early on uh, from the Health Services Authority, which is like the equivalent of the FDA, and we can bring it under a special license. And typically, we do a lot of the new devices under study. So in terms of radio frequency ablation, this is what my used to go to thermal technique was. I, I'll be honest with you, I know there's a lot of laser enthusiasts out there and having I mean, heard of a few from, from a few of them, I must say that in our Asian population, I think I've gone away from laser because I still think it does cause a more pain than radio frequency ablation. Uh, I've actually gone away from the uh, benefits uh, from Electronic to the EVRF when before I started using microwave and I must say the results I've had with the EVRF monopolar has been very good and patients have been very satisfied. This paper was brought up by Mark uh, uh, in his talk but the reason why I bring it up is that you know you look at the long-term data of radio frequency ablation it is wonderful it is actually very good and if you look at you look at that paper you know then in terms of uh, people coming back at 15 years there was a number about 58 about nearly 90 percent clinical success rate very i mean 100 percent satisfaction rate and re-interventions on those patients were only really for de novo or disease progression and not for recurrence so how do you better this you know to be frank to be frankly honest I mean, I bring this trial up because this is the, probably the only unrandomized trial comparing the three types of radio frequency ablation. Um, and again, uh, one of the things it brings out shows a very good res result rate, but the EBRF, which I, which I use, basically showed an earlier failure rate at six months compared to the other two devices. And there was a question of whether we should be starting the ablation closer to the sphenofemoral junction than what we're accustomed to of that 20 millimeter or 25 millimeter distance. So in terms of RFA application, we've, Mark has gone through the basic science really and what you're trying to achieve. But the things that are very important is obviously to get uh, apposition of the vein against the probe, the vein wall against the probe. And therefore you have to get uh, the head down if for the bigger veins to collapse that vein down or good tumescence to get that vein strung onto the catheter and obviously with uh, external compression. What I've noticed even with RFA is that you do, however good you give the tumescence, and I'm very particular, especially during training as well, to get that tumescence in the correct place and then give it properly, um, you do get a uh, a lot of bruising you do get some patients do get a lot of bruising and there is a, a small but in, obviously there's a small but significant rate of nerve damage and that's reported in the literature 
And a lot of these patients, and there's a question of whether we should be putting compression on these patients post-operatively. And as some of my colleagues very well know, getting compression on patients in the Far East in the temperate climate can be very difficult. And even post-operatively now, I don't, I'm not prescriptive. I basically give the patient a choice. And there has been recent evidence to suggest that whether you actually do need compression after thermal ablation. We uh, did a study with Kathleen Gibson from the US and looked at the uh, kind of the anatomy, the venous anatomy of our Asian patients compared to the uh, Caucasian US uh, uh, patients. And we did find some differences. And we found that a lot of our patients uh, basically uh, are generally older than the US. Uh, we did quite a significant number of patients. Um, and in terms of the venous anatomy, uh, we, we get a lot of patients who are present much later at CEEP4 uh, compared to those who present with CEEP2 disease. And if you look at the vein sizes and where the reflux start, I think you can say that safely said our Asians, our vein diameters are much, actually much uh, smaller uh, at all levels. And they tend to be refluxing all the way from ankle to groin. And there is a significant component of out of fascia, uh, uh, especially the N3 vein. So these are the type of veins that are the legs that we tend to get. We don't tend to get this kind of as, much, as much as the C2 disease. We get a lot more C, uh, C4A and above. And that I think should tend a lot of be below knee, uh, below knee uh, uh, great saphenous vein reflux. So, you know, and so you've got to come and tailor your, well, how you're going to deal with that truncal vein ablation using what specific advices. And that's why I think a lot of non-thermal techniques have taken off. And this is an example of a bad skin and going through a very difficult field. And this is an example of using uh, uh, glue uh, uh, for, the short, uh, for the small saphenous vein. So whenever I begin, the, uh, begin any kind of uh, 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 treatment for a patient with chronic venous insufficiency, I think it's, I think it's obligatory to get an ultrasound. There are still people actually practicing uh, dealing with veins, especially more on the general side. Uh, you usually dealing with varicose without an ultrasound. I think that become, I think it's become mandatory because actually it gives you a lot of information uh, where the reflux starts, where it ends, the size of the vein, so that you can tailor your therapy. And how I go about choosing very much depends on what I find on the ultrasound and also based on the patient themselves. And ultimately, look at the size of the vein, the length, where it is, where the location of the reflux is, is there a superficial component uh, of, the, of the truncal vein? Where are the, what are the neighbors for, the, for, the, for, the, for that vein? Uh, the disease state, the patient type, and typically we do get much thinner patients than our Caucasian counterparts, and whether, obviously, what the patient is in terms of society, and that's, uh, unfortunately, that is part of the issue as well. So which veins do I choose for uh, endovenous microwave ablation? I tend to actually have replaced my, uh, since I uh, started learning how to use this, I've started using it mainly on the C2 and C3 veins. I tend to leave the 4A and above to using non-thermal techniques as I do not want to really damage the skin further from multiple skin pricks. The equipment required ultimately, you do need an ultrasound and then obviously a local anesthetic pump for the tumescence. So in terms of my setup, I typically put the patient uh, super for the great saphenous vein. I didn't do this for the, I haven't done so far for the great saphenous vein. Um, and uh, basically I've always put something underneath to extend out the knee so that when you do the tumescence, because a lot of our great saphenous veins actually go posteriorly and it can be quite tricky actually to get your needle down there to get the tumescence in an effective place, especially if it is quite superficial. I do a scanning vein up and down the, the leg before I start to know exactly where I, where I need to start treatment and where I need to end. Whether I get in access transverse and longitudinal, this may seem a bit, um, a bit uh, perfunctory, but I think it's quite an important thing to think about um, there's been recent data, in fact, a meta-analysis data suggesting that with longer tuna punctures, you minimize the number of passes that you have to go through the vein and the pain associated with that. 
Um, for the smaller veins, I tend to go now longitudinal because I can exactly see where the needle is entering a very small vein. And some of the veins that we do touch around two millimeters can be quite tricky on the local anesthetic, especially if it's towards the, the, the skin surface. And I think it's important to see the indentation of the needle into that vein uh, on that longitudinal axis. I always start with a micropuncture technique. When I started learning endovenous techniques in Cambridge, we used to use quite a large needle, but I think for our kind of population of patients with small veins, I always like to start with a 21 gauge uh, needle and then build up. And for the endovenous microwave ablation, we use a micropuncture set and we build up to a seven, seven, seven French sheet, very much similar to, the, to, the, uh, to, to RFA. Placement of sheath, where do I start the, the, the treatment? I typically try to start it just above where, just above where the, uh, the reflux ends on the duplex and typically in the proximal calf. I tend to actually map out the GSV if I can, because it obviously gives, also for training purposes, uh, that very, very much helps the trainee know where to put the uh, tumescence. Um, I then put in the antennae, you can see the antennae basically, and there are different markings on that antennae, and you can see the three marks basically shows the end of where you show the treatment, uh, and basically there's a marker for where the sheath, when you start to remove that sheath uh, when you're doing the pullback. And very much, again, it's basically set up to a machine, it's made by Echo, and, and obviously set up to a two-message two pump. And I tend to put the um, antennae about uh, 20 millimeters to 25 millimeters away from the saphenofemoral junction. And I actually look, and I actually look specifically for the inferior epigastric vein, because I tend to treat just below that to allow some drainage uh, uh, of the vein, of, the, of, of, of blood down that vein, if uh, so to prevent the thrombosis building up towards the junction and, were, and the risk of a he hits. Um, and I also, also I make it very point to actually see that point uh, before I start. And I tend to start the tumescence right at the junction uh, so to get the most important area uh, uh, tumesced. So in, in terms of the cocktail that I use for, uh, for the uh, tumescence, um, I've changed these over the years, but I've actually settled on that cocktail, that cocktail mixture. You know, I normally put it in a cold bag of one liter normal saline with 20 mils of 1% lignocaine with 200 mics of adrenaline to try and minimize the kind of the bruising, the, 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 hem, the hemorrhage effect, and with some sodium bicarbonate. Um, and obviously why we do that is obviously the heat transfer. Now what I've noticed with this endovenous microwave catheter, it heats up quite well. And I think it's important, uh, as I allude to, um, that you test it before you put it in because you do want to, you do want to make sure that uh, actually it's working because it doesn't look as if it's working initially. And that's a very key thing to start. In terms of my tumescent technique, it depends whether I'm actually doing it or whether I let the trainee do it. But typically I, I use a long a spinal needle from Bard and I see it. And then typically you can do this within two or even three passes uh, with this needle. And especially if you're doing this on the local anesthetic, I think this makes it much easier for the patient to, to, to tolerate. Um, and, but with the uh, normal 19 gauge needle, much better for transverse kind of assessment for the anesthetic, for putting in the anesthetic solution around the vein to get a good halo effect. Um, but very much, I think it's very much different, but the important thing is to get good tumescence. And it's important to get it, and that's the eye of that, uh, of that antennae, uh, and then obviously to get good halo effect around that, uh, around that uh, uh, antennae. Obviously, in the end, we have to make sure we perform where the final position antenna has not moved. And I tend to use two long strips to put the marker down. So during tumescence, if the leg did move, you do not risk moving that, uh, that probe any much closer. And as I said, I do look for the, uh, for the inferior epigastric vein and place the, uh, the antennae just distal to that. Um, these are some of the markings associated with the antennae. And you can see where my the top picture is showing the where the, you start removing the sheath, and the three dots to the from the end of the of the of the antennae is basically showing the uh, when the last uh, treatment should be used. Otherwise, the risk of actually damaging the skin. 
So it uses a pedal and you pull back and you do not need to compress the vein uh, down uh, onto, the, uh, onto the probe. And that's the beauty of this because you can just put no pressure. You do not even need to put the head down to do this like you have to do with RFA and laser. I follow the, what we call, I call now the white belly protocol. I mean, I learned this from Mark. In fact, I went over to see Mark at the beginning of the year, just before the COVID outbreak. And I must say, I went over for a different reason to learn haifu from him. But I must say, I picked up this, and I think it's probably the best thing I've actually done because I've had very good results with this. And I tend to use uh, this protocol where we use 40 watt setting and seven seconds per centimeter uh, treatment for each centimeter. And typically we treat the first proximal five centimeters with two treatments. And if the vein was bigger, obviously I would tailor that and basically uh, increase the amount of length of treatment uh, per centimeter. And I think one of the important things to, to, to stress when you start using this is that you must see that the vein starts to contract with the ultrasound probe um, because it, it does take a bit of time to, to start up. And if you have a problem with that, Otherwise, you basically increase the, the length of the, the treatment per centimeter. Otherwise, you can give it another cycle. And I've never had a problem with that. After the first five centimeters, I tend to do a single treatment all the way down to the exit point. And that's obviously the puncture site, which I don't normally close with any sutures. I just put a stereo strip, and that normally heals very nicely. And I do then do the phlebectomies. And I've noticed the phlebectomies, I must say, over the years, I've reduced the number of phlebectomies I've done especially in Asian patients where hematoma and bruising is quite, it can be quite significant. Uh, and, uh, and I realized that a lot of these, the smaller ones will just disappear with whatever treatment you do. And, I, and I've changed my practice since I left the UK and into Australia. And I tend to suture the, the phlebectomies because I think it gives a better cosmetic result. And I tend to put in a two layer uh, compression bandage myself and uh, using a soft band, a, 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 a soft band, a crepe, and a coban light dressing. And I tend to leave it on for 24, 48 hours and I let the patient take it off. I then offer the patient to put on a stocking for five days. And I tend not to do two weeks anymore because I don't think they can actually tolerate it. And if you look at some of our data that we've began to collect from the other studies using other devices, they tend to be non compliant. And that's kind of my post-procedural care when I, when, my, when I first started out. Um, and I must say that I have reduced the amount of, I'm the less prescriptive regarding compression hosiery. My follow-up is typically for any of these patients, and most of these are in studies, I tend to see them if they're one week to remove the sutures, or otherwise at two weeks if I haven't done any phlebectomies, I tend to see them at three and six months and at one year. And I tend to do the ultrasound myself to confirm closure. And I would potentially do more sclerotherapy at three months if there are residual varicose veins that the patient wants treated. And these are some of the post-op duplex scans that you get with these patients. And you can see that it actually does a good, it has a good effect. And actually when you put it, it normally thrombosis stops there. Uh, sometimes the vein looks actually completely patent, but actually there's no flow in that. And that could very well, but that's one of the early signs at one week. And this is an example of a leg that we did, a lady on a BMI of 30, 33. Uh, and basically this is one week following the MA. You can see very clearly there's actually no bruising. And this patient's symptoms immediately improved and she was very happy with this result. And that was the duplex that was, accept, that was found uh, post-op at one week. This is another example at one week. Uh, and again, very minimal bruising. Um, this, you can see the difference here is uh, obviously the patient who's had a phlebectomy with it. This is the one that example that I showed you in the setup of this, uh, of showing you what I do, how to put the catheter in and everything. And you can see a lot more bruising with the phlebectomies than actually doing the, the microwave itself. So I think, as a, to just to turn away slightly, I think it's important, especially in our type of patients that we get as well in Singapore, is that we've gone down a line of personalized medicine and I tailor the, the technology that we use depending on the patient and, and then basically the findings on duplex. All our duplexes are done by certified vascular sonographers as an independent measure before we actually offer surgery. Uh, and these are some of the Venus rules that I've decided to live by as, as uh, experience goes along. I treat to the lowest point of, uh, of incompetence. 
basically use whatever is safest to achieve that. I do have to consider the cost because a lot of patients have to pay for the devices. It's a consumable and it's not what we call many safe claimable from their government uh, funding. Uh, I tailor the technique according to the clinical setting. And I think it's very important to have both a thermal technique and a non-thermal technique in your armory. So a lot of people say the future of non-thermal ablation is the future of endovenous ablation. I don't think that's the truth. I'll be honest to say that, um, you know, first of all, yes, non-thermal ablation, there is minimal risk of thermal injury or no risk of thermal injury, no risk of nerve damage or paresthesia that I've seen. Obviously, you do not need the multiple pinpricks used for the tumescent anesthesia. Uh, there's minimal pain and bruising. And if you look at some of our data, especially we've done what we call the ASVS study, looking uh, prospectively at 100 patients using the, uh, for glue, the, the pain scores are very minimal. Uh, patients are very, go back to a very quick return to normal activities and it's safe and effective. However, with glue, you do get problems. And I'm beginning, because uh, I, I started using glue, I was probably the first one in Singapore, started using it back in 2016. I really am beginning to realize that in the medium term, you do get problems. And typically the problems don't start, uh, not immediately post-operative within the first two weeks, like a typical thebitic reaction, it typically can, can happen months later, especially also with the access sites. And it's very important with, if you use glue, you do not get the glue into the access site, uh, uh, subcutaneous layer, where a lot of the immunocytes are. And that's where the problems begin. And you do get quite significant kind of reactions. And I've noticed that in patients with multiple drag allergies, this reaction is much more common. And I've stopped offering this to patients with multiple drug allergies. You do get the worst form and get glue rejection. We've seen this a number of times and you can see this bit of glue that's sticking out of from, the, from, the, from, the, from, that, from that debridement. And we've actually had to excise in a number of cases, these, uh, these, uh, these, uh, these veins. So it doesn't come with its, without its problems. Whereas with thermoablation, you're not leaving any of the foreign uh, body behind. I leave you with one of my favorite uh, singers, uh, Bob Dylan. Um, basically, time will tell just who fell and who's been left behind when you go your way and I go mine. I suspect that's the way people are going to go. But I may I just feel that I think it's very important that whatever technology you use, you take it first mind to the patient. Thank you very much for listening. And I hope that's been a useful uh, talk uh, on a more practical basis. Thank you, Tajan. It was very, very interesting and very practical talk. I think uh, you make a thermal ablation or venous ablation uh, is a piece of cake after this uh, comprehensive talk. Uh, I think you have a small uh, or a little comments from the panel. Uh, I, uh, Dr. Kaneta, I think you want to comment? Dr. Victor? Yeah, I, I, will, I just would like to just, uh, I, we saw three excellent presentations. Erika showed us how is the best to do a sonogram. Also, Mark showed us an excellent view of histologic stuff and everything, and what we're supposed to do for the future. And Dr. Ju showed, showed us uh, all the expertise of everything. I think the panel was great, but my question is like, uh, I ask to everybody else, you know, what will be the final choice of your treatment? There is a question for Mark and also for Dr. June too. How do we choose the treatment? I do always laser. I'm in love with laser and I always choose laser. But tell me you guys that you will, you have just a broad spectrum higher than me. You have uh, the no thermal, you have also the echo sono staff mark and the other doctor how do you choose the best for your patients so from my point of view it comes down purely to what pattern the patient has what pattern of disease how much needs treatment where the reflux is coming from how severe the patient is and also the patient choice so we use predominantly microwave laser lots of foam lots of trollop technique, pelvic vein embolization, and HIFU. And when I do courses or when I teach my own doctors, 
you know, you start to sort of see certain patterns that are easier to treat one way or another. So it's, it's much more difficult than just, I use this. I think, you know, it's, um, it's, it's, you've got to see the patient as a whole and how, how much you have to do as well. I mean, I would echo what Mark said. I mean, I think you have to choose the technology based on the patient themselves. Ultimately, it's a choice for the patient. And in, as I said, in Singapore, we're very blessed. We actually have all the techniques available. And I've actually used all of it. So I think to say to just use one technology and because you love it so much, I think it's a difficult thing to say because I think, I think different technologies work better under different circumstances. And that's why I think really believe personalized medicine is very important because you tailor your technology of treatment for the specific, for the specific kind of venous anatomy as well as the patient. I tend not to use too much foam anymore because foam you have to use as a compression. Patients here in the Far East, well in, the, in, the, in Asia anyway, from where I am, uh, do not like to wear compression. And the, hema, the, the kind of the hematoma that you get and the, and the phlebitis is not insignificant. Um, I have been a, I've been a big fan actually of uh, mechanical chemical ablation when I first came to Singapore but I'm beginning to find there's a higher failure rate with the device um, uh, in our patients at like the three to five year period. Um, I've not re-intervened that many times. I don't see the neurovascularization that, uh, that's, that some people actually talk about, um, but I tend to be quite aggressive in what I do in terms of, if I'm gonna treat a total vein, I used to use a lot of glue and go right down to where the ulcer or where the reflux was. But now I've begun to say, look, let's mix up the thing. I tend to use the above knee. I would use a thermal and I'm beginning to feel that for below, I will maybe use a bit of a glue or I use a mocha basically. So I think it's very important to tailor it. But I, I must say in our patient populations, I've gone away from the, uh, from the, uh, from the foam aspect and sclerotherapy, but I'm beginning to feel that I'm, I think Haifu may very well be a game changer. And I've been quite frustrated because I was supposed to get to cross to come and have it done uh, when to start. Thank you. Uh, One final okay. question, uh, Ayman. I just would like just to ask them, we will start looking for the thickness of the vein wall. What are your recommendations regarding about that? Mark, can you ask that? Yeah, well, from, from my point of view, of course, we always look at the vein wall thickness, uh, as I said, but I think you can make it a bit easier in a way. I think if you use the, um, if you use the notation where your N1 veins, your network one veins, your D veins, your N2 veins are in the fascia and your N3 veins are outside, then it becomes easy. You, you use endovenous thermal ablation or one of these other catheter techniques or HIFU for the N2 veins and then foam or sclerosin for the N3 veins. And then the only questions we have to ask after that are um, perforators, do you treat them or not, which is an, another whole day, so let, let's all go there. And of course, pelvic veins, and that's the interest now. But I think I think that uh, Dennis came up with a really good point earlier on and said that, you know, you really are reaching, in thermal ablation now, we really are reaching such good results that if you do it properly, you know, we are now starting to say, we know thermal ablation now, and unless you're looking at high for something new, it's, it's all the peripheries now around that. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Victor. Uh, Omar, do you have uh, some questions? Just uh, one or two questions. Uh, okay, there is one question from a uh, doctor from Turkey, Dr. Haydar Aslan. We'll open the mic for Dr. Haydar to ask his question. I think Dr. Haydar is very familiar with microwave ablation. Dr. Haydar. Good evening, everybody. Do you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, thank you for uh, for you to give me this chance to uh, uh, ask this question. This is Haider Aslan from Turkey. We are the Middle East representative and we are uh, familiar with the uh, monopolar radio frequency and with uh, chemical ablation. We are distributor for uh, Turkish glue. Uh, what, uh, thank you, Dr. Omar, and thank you, Dr. Ayman. Also, thank you very much to Dr. Uh, Tajun. Uh, I have four questions to Dr. Tajun. Uh, for microwave ablation, uh, what about uh, 
the two centimeter pulling away from saphenal femoral junction, I hear from sa some doctor that they open uh, one incision and ligate the uh, vein from the uh, proximal part and then continue laser or other technique ablation. The second uh, question is uh, let, the us, uh, let us take question by question, Heather. Uh, Thank you very you much. like to reply, son? I think that really defeats the purpose, doesn't it? Uh, by open ligation of the vein proximally, you don't need to do that. So basically, you change a uh, minimally invasive procedure into actually a hybrid procedure or an open procedure. You don't need to ligate the vein proximally. I suspect it's because of maybe of some, you know, of fear of basically damaging the saphenofemoral junction or getting clot further. But if you stay below the inferior epigastric vein, which is a potential drainage of blood flow away, you're not going to get progression of that thrombosis actually towards that junction. So I think it defeats the purpose. Uh, but I agree with you. There is a paper out there on microwave ablation using that, that, that technique um, with, with the, the pretty good results. But I think that really defeats the purpose of what they're trying to do. Yeah. And you're going to create new vascularization as well. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Also, the possibility of using microwave ablation for big vein, like uh, we face many uh, people in Middle East with the uh, big big vein, more than 14 uh, millimeter dilated vein. Also, I asked Mr. Uh, Dr. Mark Whitley in one uh, in one uh, webinar about the same question. Thank you very much uh, for him and uh, give me uh, this uh, big chance to ask him again. Okay, so Dr. Tan to comment and then Dr. Mark to comment. I don't see a problem with the larger veins actually doing with this uh, technique. Um, you don't need to compress it down. It works by microwave as with the spread of the energy. Now, basically, you spend a bit more time when you pull back or the length of time that you set the machine on. I don't think that would be a problem at all. I think that would be a problem if you're going to use a non-thermal technique, and especially if you're going to pour glue into those kind of veins. I don't think that's a very good idea. Uh, your comment to Professor Mark? Thank you. Um, I, we published a paper in Phlebology looking at the size of veins and a thing called the smile sign. And if you email me, I'll send you a copy of it. And what we showed is with all thermal techniques, including microwave, if the vein closes concentrically, then you just use it as just the same as normal, just remembering there's a bit more tissue if it's a thick wall. But if it closes like a smile and the microwave or laser or anything is over one side, you won't be closing it in one go. And all you do is you mark how long that section is. And then when you finish, you go back up and you do it a second time and maybe a third time. And that way you can close any number, any size of vein at all. In the paper we published, 19% of the patients were over 15 millimeters, and yet we still close them all. So you might just need a multi-pass technique, but as it, just look for a smile sign or concentric, and that will tell you the difference. Okay. And your last question, the third one, Dr. Haider, and this is the last one. Thank you very much. What is the possibility of using microwave ablation for uh, below knee, like example, or perforator or uh, some venous problem for short saphenous uh, vein. Uh, is it possible to adjust the power of the machine during the procedure like what we have with the EVRF? We can adjust the uh, energy uh, at the moment. Like example, we go in a large segment, we use uh, 25 joule per, uh, per pulse or we can decrease the uh, energy according to the demand and according to the situation inside the, uh, while we are uh, proceeding the procedure. Dr. Tan? I, uh, first of all, to say, I tend not to use any thermal ablation below the knee, to be frankly honest. I think the risk and risk of damage to nerve injury, I think, is not insignificant. And even if you're going to get good tumescence, especially around the, the small saphenous vein, I don't think that's the risk worth taking, especially when you've got other techniques available. I think with the non-thermal, non-tumescent techniques such as glue and such as mechanical and chemical ablation, I think that's fair enough and the results have been very good with those uh, techniques. So um, yes, you can uh, manipulate the, the machine. Um, I haven't actually done so. I'm not sure whether uh, Mark Whiteley has for the, for the small pass for but I don't think you need to do that. If you if you if you if you've got other techniques that can minimise the risk even further of any nerve injury, and the nerve injury is not insignificant either, and it does cause a big problem. Do you like to comment, uh, Mark? Thank you. 
Yes, thank, thank you very much. I, I, say, I think that's a very sensible approach and I, I do almost the same thing. Um, we, we will use it in the small Safina Spain uh, with, with our ultrasound. We have very good ultrasonographers who we work with who do nothing but veins and we, we follow the sural nerve down on the small Safina and we only go at the point when the sural nerve is getting close. So we never get close to sural nerve. Um, we do treat below knee veins when they're perforators um, because we use the trollop technique where we put the microwave into the perforator and you have to be very careful. You have to ask the patient, can you feel anything? And there is a small risk of nerve damage with that. But again, I agree with you as well for the GSV. If I wanted to do much under the knee, more than about five centimeters under the joint, then I would use a different technique. So I, I agree. I think, you know, thermoablation has its place in this and you have to be careful under the knee. Okay. Can I just make a quick comment though before you yeah. start, before you move away from this question, I think with the uh, perforator, I know, I know it's a big issue and it's a big topic that you can talk away all day if you want to, but I think with the perforator, you're going to treat the perforator, I tend to go away, you know, you got that special, you know, you got the radio frequency to do this with, um, I tend to actually with the perforators, I'm not that aggressive, only on the setting of C, uh, C6 disease. I would actually use glue because I actually push the glue into the perforator or if the perforator is big enough, I would ligate it uh, as a small incision with ultrasound guidance. Uh, you know, it's, 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 it's one of those things, but I don't feel, I, I, I feel the risk is too high using uh, a thermal technique. Uh, maybe it's because I don't do too many of them, but we don't tend to chase the perforators here in, the, in, in, in Singapore as much. And I just use the glue to just push it in to the man and it works pretty much what, what, what needs to be done. Okay, thank you very much. That is great. And the, the rest of the question, we can put them on the YouTube channel and I promise we'll get the answer to all of them. So it's back to you, Professor Ayman. Okay, thank you, Omar. Uh, thank you all, it was a very interesting talk. Thank you, Erika. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Jean. Uh, we all enjoyed your company. We all enjoyed your company, uh, Erwin, Raul, Swat, Alvaro, uh, Dennis, uh, Rag, and Victor. Thank you all. Thank you for all attendees. You were patient with us, and uh, we all enjoyed your presence. Thank you, Sigberis Group, for sponsoring this great meeting. Uh, thank you, Prime Partner, for uh, everything and your effort to make it uh, as good as we know today. Before we leave, I remind you, mark your calendar. After 48 hours, we'll meet here with Martin Marsh, Mahmoud Salah, and the Tarek Radwan. Say, uh, uh, I want to say good night. Uh, for all of you and please stay uh, stay safe and see you on Friday 1st of May. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.